Love is the way forward. This is the reason why we're here tonight, to honor our master teacher, our brother, infinitely, Brother Vaughn Benjamin, the Aki Becker in Midnight. Many people asked me why and how can we do what we're doing, having a sacred gathering to honor this brother. Now, the people that may ask that are people that may not know who the master teacher was. If anyone was to know who Vaughn Andre Benjamin was, they would never ask that, you see. Now, Vaughn, I had to tell people the story because people don't understand the reason I did this and how profound he is to me. I'm a student of him, you know, like truly, deeply, 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 truly a student. The first time I heard Midnight, they came to me in New York. I had a club in New York. And this is how society can, you know, we can lose our way. At those times, it was many years ago, I had a club and Sister Kofunia brought him to me to want to do a show. I'd never heard of them. I never knew who Midnight was. Distracted in society, you know, chasing the dollar. I was promoting all type of dance hall, you name it. I produced Reggae Carafest in New York for many years. And when they told me about this, I told them, you know what, I'll give you the spot for an early show. That, that's the best I can do since I don't know. So forgive my ignorance. I'm just being honest with you guys tonight. A young brother being ignorant and not knowing better. So that evening, I left to go home and I came back and I walked in and asked security, is the DJ still playing? Why is the band started yet? And the DJ told me, you need to go upstairs. I'm like, okay. I walked upstairs and you, you ever get shocked and astonished, I was shocked and astonished, not only because of the vibration of the people, the club was packed, I mean packed, you couldn't walk, and, but on top of that, the sound was so pristine that I thought it was a DJ, and mind you, I'm a sound engineer, so I was shocked and listening to the word sound, and that evening, uh, it changed my life, it really, really did, and it took me two years begging Preston and Ronnie and Vaughn to get them on my stage. They would not perform in Carafest because I promoted dance hall. It was so impactful. I shifted from dance hall to get Midnight on my show, to do a Roots show. And nothing against dance hall, but I have never done a dance hall concert since. I've been promoting Roots and positive music since then. I have toured with Vaughn for all these years. Changed my life. That's the power of music. That's the power of who he is. Not who he was, who he is. Because he shall live forevermore within us. Everything that he taught us, we shall continue to promote and be that beacon that he spoke of. Because he said he didn't come here to teach. He came here to wake us up. You understand? I told a friend tonight, we should be concerned what's going on on the other side when the father can call soldiers home that that's strong. This is spiritual warfare out here. We must recognize this and stand together. Stand together with the things that he spoke of. He spoke of love at its core, about humility and living a simple life. If you ever knew him, he's a brother. I mean, I used to wrestle with him because he would come off stage from doing a three hour set and I wanna go back to the hotel and he still gotta sit three hours backstage still talking and teaching the people. That's who he was. Now, mind you, I'm tired and I want to go back to sleep because I got to wake him up to go to the next show. But you know what? In understanding who he was, that he was here to see something in all of us, that's what it was. He saw that spark deep within us. He always says, Denisio, you know what? God chose you. Keep doing what you do. And that right there is why we're here tonight, to honor this brother in such a powerful way. That's why we will have this discussion tonight. Because he was here, and me and him spoke profoundly. He was to be on this stage as one of the panelists. When I came with this idea and put it together, me and him spoke in depth about this. And he said, Denise, you know, there's a time for singing and dancing, but then there comes a time for serious discussion. And this is what he told me. And so I had to continue with this event in spite of his Zion transition. Now he can hear us up in the celestial, up in the summit, and his spirit will be here amongst these speakers tonight in honor of him, in honor of the most important thing, love and moving forward together in love. Allow me to introduce this panel tonight of profound people 
that will allow them to introduce themselves and pass you to the moderator, Ms. Aja Monet. Give them a round of applause. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Aja um, Monet. I'm a poet originally from Brooklyn, New York, and I live in Little Haiti, Miami. Um, I co-founded a collective called Smoke Signal Studio that runs out of our home. It's an organizing cultural uh, space, a space where community organizers, activists, um, artists, and cultural workers can des design and create the Miami that they want to be in and uh, to work towards freedom more than the things that are against us. And so I'm grateful to be here in Miami hosting this conversation. And I'm gonna allow the panelists briefly to, um, to, to, to introduce themselves, name your name, where you're from, and uh, a song that you love that you're listening to right now. Oh, wow. On the spot. Yes. Greetings, brothers and sisters. <laughs> blessed love, blessed love, everyone. We are here together, what a beautiful moment. I am Janine. I am a performing artist, producer, <coughs> wellness professional, yoga teacher, doula in training, mm. black woman, just healer, yeah? Healing myself and trying to do that for my community as well. It's my brief introduction mm. on this auspicious panel. So the conversation will continue. It's a pleasure to be here with all of these wonderful people and all of you as well because it's our conversation, right? Yes. So looking forward. Bless it, love. Uh, Julius Garvey, um, physician, uh, living in New York, born in Jamaica. Glad to be here with you. I don't know about a special song, but um, <laughs> certainly Marvin Gaye, what's going on? Mm. Is appropriate for tonight. Good. That's a good one. Uh, Rashida Faid, uh, born in Morocco, and I live in Boca Raton. I'm a hypnotherapist and a uh, mm. healer and a uh, Reiki uh, um, master, and I, I used to teach like a professor at the university, and I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right, give it up, give it up, come on. Well, for those that may not know me, my name is Amara La Negra. Um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm real spicy, you know. <laughs> um, I am an artist. I am also, I'm an artist, I sing, I dance, I act, I do a little bit of everything. And I am also an activist for the Afro-Latino community. I was born and raised here in Miami, and, and um, I am a proud Dominicana. And, um, and favorite song, well, of course, you don't have to promote myself. Yes, my new song, There's No Way. Go check me out, download it, you know. That's the song that I'm listening to now. Good job. <laughs> Good job. Yes. <laughs> Greetings, family. I would like to give honor and praise to his most high, Yah Rastafari. Selassie I the first. I'd like to give honor and praise to His Majesty and Empress Manning for allowing us to be here because of the work that they have done, allowed um, Midnight and Vaughn Benjamin and uh, today Aki Becker that have produced this awesome music and information to share with us. So I want to honor his spirit and his transitioning. So we give thanks because I know that's the primary reason why we're here, because we're all here. There's a connection with him. That's why we're here. And I'm Baba Pearson, and uh, I'm a work in progress. And <laughs> yeah, brother. Definitely. And I've, I've evolved into using the cosmos, the universe, that give us things on a daily basis, and use them to serve my people. I'm a servant of the people. And so I'd like to give thanks for being here, and the wisdom that has given to me, I'm here to share it with you, to open up your hearts and minds so you can become more holistic and more realistic about living on this earth plane, especially living in the Northern Hemisphere. So I would like to say to you, there's something that's very special about Midnight and uh, Vaughn Benjamin, and there's a specific song that I've been listening to since like, in the early, late 80s, 90s, called The Bushman. 
So I am a bush man. A bush man. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. So we're here tonight uh, in part to talk about love as a way forward, but mostly to also address um, the importance of solidarity amongst African people and the diaspora. Um, one of the things that has been a challenge for, for many of us who are in societies that um, are run by people that don't necessarily reflect or look like us um, is trying to see ourselves and to find ourselves and to gather and to organize and be together. And one of the first questions I wanted to ask was, um, when was the first time that you felt seen uh, by your community, by your people, by the people who love you? And when was the first time that you saw yourself as you wish to be, as you hope to be? I remember that I evolved in, in Guyana. And evolving in Guyana and manifesting in Guyana, I always felt I know who I am. Because I know that after uh, my matriculation, I am that I am. And uh, I came from a source. And so my, my parents, my mother told us that um, everyone in the, in the area, in the town or in the village area, always tell her that um, your, your children are not from here. So you know, we from up there. You know, we like the Dogons. <laughs> so, I know that each and every one of you know yourself. I know you know who you are. You just got to make the connection. That's why I'm here to serve you. I know who I am, and I love who I am, to serve you. Give thanks. Well, in my case, I will say that when was the first time I saw myself? I would say I was about 15 years old or so when um, I... You know how you always, they always celebrate Black History Month, which I've always been somewhat against it because why should it just be one month, right? It should be all year round. Why should we just select this one specific month? Mm. But anywho, I never bothered to pay attention to any of the classes because I was always raised very cha-cha, very Latina, very, very high alia, very in that environment. And um, it, it took one day for me to actually listen. We were in a history class, and I was actually paying attention to the history of you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Rosa Parks and all the amazing things that, that they did, that I realized, I went back home and I told my mom, I have a question. Why do you make me perm my hair? Hmm. Why do you, like after I took that class, I just came back like, why do, why do you make me suffer so that society can accept me and see me as beautiful? So it was that day that I decided to stop perming my hair. My mom saw, you know, I had never spoken to her the way that I did. And she respected me and she apologized. And she said, you're right. You're mm. right. You are beautiful just the way that you are. And I have been forcing you somewhat to, to satisfy society's standards of beauty. And I decided to stop perming my hair. All of my hair fell off. <laughs> You know how it is when you perm and all of it falls off. And then the process of starting from zero again, it was a beautiful thing. That was the day that I really understood my beauty and who I was as a person and what my purpose was. And I became an activist at the age of 15, 16 for the Afro-Latino community. And when did I see that people saw me the way that I wanted to be seen? Unfortunately, it took love and hip hop, for those that may watch it or may have seen me on social media. It took love and hip hop for people to actually listen to me and listen to the things that I was talking about, about colorism, about racial profiling, about in, you know, injustices that were happening in my community because unfortunately a lot of people felt that only slaves were dropped off in America. Only black people suffer here. Only there is racial profiling here. And I'm like, no, all around the world, we go through it too. Even amongst my own Latino community, I've been seen as, oh, you're pretty for being black. Or, oh, did you do your nose because it doesn't match your skin color, whatever that means. <laughs> or, do you, do you do blackface, which I get it all the time. Or all kinds of stupidity. So I think that once I was able to be per, per, you know, perceived on Love & Hip Hop before my activism and the things that I went through, I think that that was a day that people saw me the way that I wanted to be seen. Mm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I came from Morocco, and uh, uh, I remember the first time I had uh, rebelled against my father 
because I, I was top student and I got this you know money for to go for higher education. I didn't want to, I'm from Casablanca, I didn't want to go to Rabat because it was kind of close by home, you know, and we'll, they will still have control over me and all that. So I told my dad that I want to go to England, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, my dad was completely against England because Morocco was colonized by the French, so the only place he can go to Paris, you know, because I had an uncle there. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing was that my, my father was in, insistent that I don't go without a man. I had to be going with, a, with, you know, like a man to protect me and all that. So I remember one time, at that time I was activist also in Morocco. I became actually atheist uh, at the age of 18 and I just rebelled and, uh, against everything. And then I remember when I told my father that, um, you know, if, if he doesn't let me go, he would lose me completely and I would not come back, you know. So and then I just, and then he thought about it, like, okay, I'll let her. And he uh, kind of signed because Morocco had, he had to sign my paper and then I, uh, you know, I got the passport and then I went to Paris, to Sorbonne, because that's the only, although I wasn't supposed to be there, I wanted to be in, uh, in England. And from there, I just, uh, one year I finished my master's, I got the visa, came to the States. So my dad was like, what? So I'm here. I've been here from 1990, you know? So I'm home. Wow. <laughs> this is home. Nice. So that's, uh, Thank you. Anyone else like to share? I don't know that I had any crisis in that sense of identity. Um, maybe I'm a little bit peculiar. Um, <laughs> being ra raised in the household of quotes of a famous uh, a person. Mm. And it was a different kind of identity problem, if you will. Um, and, and I think this is where love comes into it in terms of how you're raised as an individual. If, if you have a loving uh, parent, then you're accepted. And that's what love means, you're accepted as you are. And um, I was accepted as I was. Um, and the only, um, should I say, proscription that we, we had, I think both my brother and I, was that we had to live up to a very high standard, the standard of Marcus Garvey. So we, we had this um, ideal that we had to uh, excel, but it was excelling in your own way, not having to imitate and do the same thing that my father did, but just that we would never, in a sense, disgrace the Garvey name, per se, but we would always um, um, do something that was worthy of the name Garvey. So we always strived in that sense. So it was a way, I think, of getting the best out of us as children, both my brother and myself. And he excelled significantly uh, academically, etc. So um, we always had positive role models and positive identities in our house. And I think it's because of a loving mother and a mother who respected her mate and use him as an ideal for us to um, grow towards. Mm. Well, you can respond if you want to that question, but I want to first, because there's a question that I have at, that's mm. related to what you just said around love. Um, I think we, t we think oftentimes of our family in these identity ways, like my mother, my father, and it changes the way relationships are seen. And I think often if we looked at all of our relationships as the practice of uh, completing the ultimate level of a friendship. So that whether it's their mother, your cousin, your auntie, your uncle, that friendship should be the root of, um, of our relationships with one another. I wanted to ask, um, what role has love played specifically in your sense of self-worth? And who was the most loving, supportive person in the sense of what was their characteristics that they showed? Because I think we often talk about how the ways we don't feel loved and the ways that we don't see love, but what are the affirmative characteristics of how a loving friendship relationship showed up for you so we can learn together how to be, what those characteristics are, how to practice them? I think I can address this one for sure. This this helps me answer that first question because like Dr. Gavi, I grew up in a home where I felt accepted and supported and loved. I felt 
I was made to understand that I was beautiful, not despite the fact that I was dark-skinned, but almost because of it. Yeah. So I grew up with a father who was, you can call him mixed race, and for him, like, dark skin meant something to him. His mother was a very, very dark-skinned woman, and he saw how his father loved his mother. And so when I was born, I'm the last of my brothers and sisters, as my brother and sister rather and I'm the darkest one in my family and I remember being made to feel like that was a special thing and I was much younger than my other siblings so by the time I was talking we were talking about this before by the time I was sentient I was aware that they didn't have a lot of time to do the same level of disciplining that they did with my brother and sister so I really Dr. Gabby said oh you're the last one you're spoiled and I'm like we can call it that just, you know, but in, a, in the real sense, I think having, growing up with a man in my life who was, my father is a pastor, and he's like a country pastor who takes care of his community and his family and people look up to one, that kind of old time pastor. So I grew up with that in my mind, like, this is the idea of what a man is supposed to be. And I saw how he treated my mother. And I grew up in that little bubble of, okay, this is what family is. And, you know, I was able to speak with them and they would talk to me rather than just beating and reprimanding. We had conversations about things. Mm. So all of that is why I am the woman I am today, just confident. I mean, probably people wouldn't even understand the level of my confidence because I just didn't go through some of the struggles, <laughs> you know? And so, and another thing I was sharing with Dr. Garvey too is that growing up with love and acceptance, it means that your confidence is part of your character. And so if, conf if you had to fight for that, then that becomes a part of your character. The fight becomes a part of your character. Mm. And you may exude a confidence that is really not, you, it's almost like you don't believe it, so you have to defend it. And you see that the women have hardened and the brothers have, and everybody's just, you better know, <laughs> as opposed to just living and sitting in that seat of confidence and love. And you have to see it. Like, love is a thing you have to see in mm. action mm. in order to be able to share it. Because you may want to share love, but if you've never really experienced it, you may not even know when you are being loved. Yeah. You know? That was deep. Praise it. Anything else, anyone? Oh, I mean. I want to say something <laughs> about love. I think we need to define love. Mm. To really, I wanted to, to really start with that, but I didn't want all of y'all to be like, what's love? It. And then it'd be a whole, well, <laughs> that's that's a whole good what's good love got to do with it? What's <laughs> love to you? <laughs> no, but, you know, I think love is a term that's been sort of bastardized. You know, people make love, and of course that's a physical act, and it has nothing and to do with love necessarily too. with love. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of um, people think that love is just being goody-goody and nicey-nicey and so on, um, and giving you what, what you want or acceding to what you ask for. So you get that kind of relationship, which is really a dependency relationship. Or if, if you give me what I want, I'll give you what you want, and that's the basis of love. You know, it's that kind it's of a, a contract. Re re it's mm -hmm. a contract. It's that She's kind of Babylon re love. Re re <laughs> okay, it, 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 and that's where most of us are stuck. I think you have to go deeper than that in, in terms of love. Love is is basically the, the most, I think, fundamental feeling that you can have, and and it's very much like like compassion. Um, it, it it has no characteristics per se. It's just total acceptance. Unconditional. Un unconditional acceptance. Yeah. And you mentioned that you can feel that. Mm -hmm. it, it's, not, it's not about the, the things or what the person even says. It's the unconditional acceptance of you as a person, irrespective of what you do or how you behave. And it's that level of understanding. And to me, that's how I would define love mm -hmm. in terms of the discussion. Mm. Um, uh, for, uh, just to follow up with you know, on, uh, his conversation about the definition of love, you know, the first, uh, you know, the Sufis, they talk about the mm -hmm. layers that the heart has uh, about four layers. And the first layer is like you're looking at the world as in the concrete, which is the dense, of, you know, when you look at what I want from you, what you want from me, and, um, you know, what I need from you, what you need from me. 
But when we go beyond that, when we move, you know, there is a spark of light that comes to the heart, then we wake up a little bit. There is this kind of awakened divine love that starts, you know, mm. to, to take hold and then start this fire that mm. consumes, you know, all the, the ego things, the attachments, the, uh, uh, the desires, you know, the prestige, the, the titles and all that. And that, you know, becomes this kind of uh, uh, generous heart where we come, like you were saying, I'm a servant, I serve, I'm here to serve and I'm, I'm uh, you know, like a servant True of the charity. beloved. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, that's, you know, second layer and then you walk deeper and that's kind of, they call it the angelic, you know, realm of, mm -hmm. uh, of the heart. And then beyond that, you know, is the third layer is to, is kind of uh, where, where you walk deeper, where you actually shut, you know, all the senses, basically what you hear, you know, the things you look at, you know, you, you transcend this, this lower desires, this natural desires or the instinctual desires, and then we really start to, to long for the beloved, and you don't know what it is. You're just almost like being feverish and sick and, and not feeling good. You know, you don't want to work. You just, you know, everything that used to make you kind of happy is not there anymore. So that's, you know, then you get to a different kind of deeper, deeper level of, of uh, a love that that really awakens uh, capacity within us. And then you start to look for what's the purpose, you know, and who is the real beloved that we are all longing for because we are kind of disconnected. We were separated from, from the, uh, our home, which is within. And, and then, so that's kind of the, the heart in Arabic, you know, it's called the qalb. The qa sound, it looks like the spiral. You know? Mm. So the spiral actually takes you in, within, within, inside, and you get to the lub, lub which is love. Lub becomes a V sound. Mm. So that's the lub. The lub is like the, uh, the lamb, the lamb sound, lamed, you know, in Hebrew. The lamb is kind of, uh, um, uh, it, it, it's kind of like a, you, you, you kind of slide down because within our heart when you meditate, you know, maybe the first layer you start to see maybe colors, you see purple, you see a lot of, you know, maybe you see angels, you might see also like a negative uh, entities, which is possible. But beyond that, there is like a, when you slide down, you know, you go deeper and you enter this hole and, and within us. And then that place becomes like you are in the ocean of uh, beauty and, and light and the divine, you know, contained, you are loved, you are nourished you don't you know like the prana living you know you just have a great time life is just amazing <laughs> so then you start to look at, at people as they're all the face of the, the beloved that you are peace of god you are face of god you are my brother you are my sister so everybody that becomes like this this love for 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 humanity love for for even the enemy love for everybody so it transcends that really gives you this uh, this um, uh, not passion, you know, because passion is still lower uh, part of us, but really takes you to this compassion and mercy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the mercy, which is, you know, going mm. back to, like I was talking to my brother earlier, uh, Baba, you know, about the, uh, the mercy that the, the rahim, the rahim is the, uh, the womb of the woman. So that darkness, you know, it's like that's what contains us all. Mm. And it's the most beautiful aspect of us. That's the, uh, the stillness. When you get to that place, you are in the essence. You are in the deepest, oh, the deepest place and you are beautiful. I love Gary's face. <laughs> she broke down the language, the etymology, all the different words. Okay. okay. I love it. Honor in the bond, right? Because he's like that. Alarm. Well, tonight I want to be completely honest and, and transparent. I think the people know me for being that way. I mean, um, I do reality TV, and somewhat it is kind of hard to hide anything. My life is an open book. So I want to talk um, about the biggest love in my life, what I have known for what love is. And I want to also touch a really iffy topic, and it's really important to me, which is self-love. Mm -hmm. But talking about love, in my eyes, my biggest love and the person had, that has shown me the, the most unconditional love has been my mother. Um, my mother is what I define as love. I've seen her sacrifice every single part of her being for me, almost her life giving birth to me. Um, 
my father wasn't involved in my in my life obviously after I became famous of course he came around but um, <laughs> my mother has shown me what love is she and not just tender hugs and kisses but even being strict even being demanding of me because she knows of my potential she knows of what I'm capable of so sometimes it's, it's been a little bit too much but then I know that it comes from a good place so I would definitely say that the way that my mother has shown me love um, sometimes has been a good thing and it's been a bad thing I've seen her be a very strong powerful woman because she's had to be the man and the woman in the household and sometimes it's been a bad thing in my eyes because Sometimes it's been a little bit difficult to have a man in my life because of the way that I've seen, the way that she treats men and the way that she carries herself. And sometimes it's okay to be loved. It's okay to accept love. Yes, people may hurt you, but that doesn't mean that you can't continue to give love, to give love and be loved. Um, yeah, that is most definitely important. I think that a lot of times when we get hurt by others, we feel as if we have to take vengeance and towards the rest of the people, and that's definitely hurtful for yourself. So I would say that, you know, uh, she's done a great, she's a great mother, and she's definitely taught me all those amazing things. Um, and now I am learning a different type of love with my uh, future husband over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. But, uh, <laughs> Do you want to? Marcus. <laughs> but but uh, two seconds before I won't make this I won't make this long. Self love to me it's such an important thing um, that I think that when we're talking about love and love love comes from a lot of places but it's important to also love yourself in just the way that you are. Um, for those that may not know I used to be bulimic for three years. I ended up being hospitalized like twice. Um, all the acid from you know mm -hmm. uh, vomiting out, uh, destroyed my vocal cords for a very long time. I didn't accept myself the way that I was because I wanted to be, I, my dream has always been as a little girl to be famous and be on TV and be all these things that I used to see. And I wanted to have long legs and long arms and be like the Victoria's Secret models and long neck. And that's naturally not the way that my genetics is set up, okay? I have hips and I have a big butt and I'm curvy and that's just who I am. Um, it took a really long time for me to accept those things to the point that I, I hated myself when I saw myself in the mirror. I didn't like the person that I saw because I wanted to be someone else because that's what I understood that that's what you had to be in order to be beautiful, right. you know? Um, so definitely, you know, I, if, I don't, if I don't leave tonight without saying anything that may touch anyone, most definitely learn to accept and love who you are. Society is going to do everything possible to break you down and tell you all the reasons why you're not beautiful and why you're not great and why you need to look like Kim Kardashian and Jennifer Lopez and Beyonce and all these things. You're not built like that. Who you are is who you were meant to be. And the reasons why God put you in this earth is for a reason. So love and embrace your curves, your stretch marks, your dimples, all of it. Love all of it. <laughs> Brethren. Well, well. <laughs> After that, right? <laughs> the ladies in love. <laughs> what I would like to say about the whole process of uh, us manifesting here on this earth, um, especially uh, people of uh, African ancestry um, living in this part of the world, in, uh, in the islands, and living in America and in England and all those different places where the uh, Europeans came and colonized us and they did a serious damage on our psyche. Mm -hmm. And we have evolved into using the word love, but we always seem to be falling in and falling out of it. Hmm. Many, many times over, we even have children and we don't even take care of our own children. You know, and we always seem to be running to the people that uh, colonize our minds and begging them for something and loving them more than we love ourselves. Mm. So, this business of love, there's no condition to it. There's no unconditional love. You really got to sing and think about these words that you're using, the word song and the power. You can't put a condition to what you really truly care for. If you care for Mother Earth and Mother Nature, if you care for the planet, if you care for your family, if you truly care for yourself, and you talk about love all day long, but you're putting all the wrong thoughts inside of it, you'll be damaging yourself all the time. That's not love. I was reading the Iceman Inheritance, and we never spoke about love when he speaks to the elders and the ancestors because the Iceman Inheritance went way back. And he was speaking of things that most of us don't speak of these today. So I'm suggesting that um, 
the word love, we should really sit down and ponder on it, give it some thought, and maybe sometime go and even use it. Mm. Because it's from the West. We're not from the West. We're from the South. <laughs> uh, we grew up in a way where there's no such thing of, um, where you have to go and worship somebody. <clears throat> we, if you worship somebody, it's our elders, it's our ancestors. Yeah. We had a group of elders to guide us all the time. Mm. So then they put us in a, in a system we call Christianity in the church. And then we go and start to worship somebody that doesn't even look like us. And then we start loving that energy. Are you really sitting and think about it? This is why my sister can um, speak on these things about not loving her blackness. So I was very, um, not necessarily fortunate, but it so happened that I was born in a place in a time, even though the Europeans was there, and they used to cut off the men's head and put them up in a stick in, 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 along, the, along the, uh, the, uh, the, the highways and the byways in Guyana. They were very wicked people. And so you didn't have no time to love yourself for 500 years of them abusing you. You didn't even know the word love was, not even in your vocabulary. Mm. So when you leave here tonight and you look at yourself in the mirror, you got to really figure out who am I, what's my purpose here. And as far as I know personally and the ancestors taught me is that we're just here to take care of each other. And if you want to call it love, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But we're just here to take care of each other, take care of our village, take care of our community. And we, we, we seriously need, if you want to call it love, take our resources, our currency and, and energy and build our communities right here and in Africa. Mm. Yeah. So this, this is, that's a good uh, segue because the next question is about, um, you know, since, since we're having a conversation and you brought up self-love and you brought up the importance of the self, we live in a capitalist system where in order for it to thrive, it has broken the collective uh, vision, the vision around collectivism, and it has made people more about the I, individualistic. And it's one thing to have values and want to live nice and to want to have resources. It's another thing to step on your brother and sister's neck to get it and to continue uh, to, to, to uh, have envy and foster negative behavior and jealousy mm -hmm. for the sake of a dollar, or the sake of self, uh, you know, accumulation of, of things. And so one of the things I had a question was, um, as a writer and as a poet, I know that when I come to the page, I can feel the we. I know that there are moments where my hand is moving and it's not just me there. There are, there are thousands of people that come to, to the page with me. And I wanted to ask, uh, because, because the Western world has separated the I and the we so much, you know, and, and the Rastas, they talk about I and I, right? What, what is your relationship to the collective, to the we, and how do you, um, how do you stay grounded and rooted in your relationship to your community? I, I'd like to take that. <laughs> I, I would like to say on that, this <coughs> business of commercialism mm. is not an African thing. No. That's a Western ideology philosophy process of commercializing everything because what happens is that when they decide to commercialize everything, they decide to uh, charge you for it. We never charge each other to take care of each other. And so when we realize who we are, and we get out of this Western ideology thinking, and, and we start getting into our African mind, we can become Ubuntu. Because of you, I am. Because of me, you are. That's what we're all about. And so there's a thin line between love and commercialism, there's a thin line between spirituality and commercialism. So you have to have that line between your commercial life <laughs> and your spiritual life. So if you go too commercial, you can get all the physical uh, imp impediments. You can get cold, fever, flu, you can get constipation, you can get clogged up liver, kidneys. Yeah, you even get cancer. Your mind is creating all that because you're thinking about commercialism, materialism, buying, buying, shopping, shopping all the time. And there's no love in buying and shopping all the Like right now, you go out there and you're shopping and you buy not necessarily y'all, maybe some of y'all, I don't know. <laughs> and so you're wasting all your currency and all your time and your energy and, and your resources in accumulating things that you're going to eventually die and leave right here on this earth. Mm. So we've got to start valuing our time and valuing our resources and valuing our spirituality. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, this is an interesting way to have a discussion, one at a time, and everyone answers a question. This isn't how it happens in the village, you know, but we, are, we appreciate that. We appreciate it. I want to say two things. One thing is about self. But before I even say that, language, especially the English language, is a limitation. Mm. So having, the, having to have these kinds of discussions in English will always have that, you know, a uh, little undertone of argument about what words mean. So let us agree here today that when we use these Western words, we understand the essence. Let us, let us speak from essence, mm. right? So if we're going to really have this conversation and be present here together, I want to just invite you. It will take two, sec two minutes. Mm. I want to invite everyone to just be present in their space, in their bodies right now. Which means, just for a moment, just put your feet on the ground. Put both your feet, plant them on the ground. You can even take your shoes off if you feel like. But just put your feet on the ground. Try to sit up so that you feel your sitting bones sitting on the chair. Lift up your chest, broaden across your chest so your lungs can breathe. Lift up, open up. And just take a few breaths through your nose. And as you breathe through your nose, just close your eyes a moment and remember, yes, there are lots of people here, but we are all one, and so it's really just the eyes. And everything I do affects my brothers and sisters, so it is really just the eyes. So we close our eyes, and we just take three breaths together, and we just be present in our bodies. We just clear the way for this discussion. Just clear out your mind. The thoughts that come into your mind, don't judge yourself. Just breathe and bring the idea, not love the word, but the idea, that warm idea that the Empress described that comes from meditation and opening and oneness. Let us cultivate that. And we take one more breath together and we exhale together. Now the point I will make on the self. I have an African mind. I am in this world but I am not of this world. And I am painfully aware of it because of the industry that I am in. And I struggle with that and kind of making sure that I remember that I am not of this world. Whenever things like anxiety and depression and those things come and all of these angsts, I use them as a trigger to remind myself, you, that is not you. Mm. You are not even your body. You have a body. So we have bodies. The bodies are the densest manifestations of our spirit. But that which we really are, we all are. So when we're talking about community, we're talking about ourselves because even if we don't see the ripple effects immediately, mm. everything you do has implications not just on your family but on everyone around you. So when we think of self, let us remember that there is a most high. This is not a man in the sky. This is a position. This is a place. And that original state has to be stillness. Has to be stillness. And so when I think, when I think of the Most High, or God, or whatever a one would choose, whichever English word you would choose based on your culture, it is stillness. It is that perfect, original, unconditioned state that everything emanates from. That's what we have in common. And if we identify with that, as opposed to with the bodies and the what I look like, then it makes it a little easier when I have to deal with you because I'm not just mm. affected by what I'm seeing, mm. but I'm looking beyond your flesh. And it will help us to identify real people in this world because you are feeling, you are calming your spirit. So, last thing, calm your spirit. You see that zero place that we're able to go and we breathe and we're still and we... That you, did you feel that around the room when you went? Yes. That is the place we must communicate from. That is the place we must make our decisions from. Mm. So that when it is we're having these conversations, I'm not reacting before I even interact. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just throw the whole paper away. Yeah, Just I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> There's the, there's the role that you're supposed to play, you know, in organizing structures. I don't like structures. Um, we're women. We don't really work with it. No, we it's don't work human. with it. No. Flexible. But I, I appreciate um, the conversation getting, and getting us grounded in the breath, in the spirit. 
And one of the things that I think of, especially since we're here celebrating Von Benjamin and thinking about sound, and we were talking, Baba was talking earlier about, they call it the Big Bang Theory, right? <laughs> How ir ironic that everything started with sound and the ability for us to speak words over each other, and that words have power. Yes. They have weight. And so to be mindful of our intention. tongue, mm -hmm. that we, we, we speak ill sometimes over each other, that we don't even realize the weight of words. You know, he said someone was from years ago brought up that he was something you said years ago that still car they carry it with them. Mm. And we think sometimes we say stuff and it has, it has no relevance. Oh, we're just going to just throw words around. Mm -hmm. And so part of my, my relationship to this moment and being here with you all is also we came together to celebrate someone who used gr with great, great humility, yes. sound and words and vibration and the ability for us to higher our vibration based off of how we, freak, how we relate it to our frequency mm -hmm. from here. So what is, I want to know, what's your relationship to sound, to music, to breath? to being present with, with, your, with your life, with your body, in the same way we just were? Well, I mean, I'm the, I'm, I, mean, I'm, I guess oh, I'm the, one, the only one that does music up here, right? So I guess that goes for me. We all do a little music. We all do a little music, oh, okay. a little bit. You do a little music. Everybody has music. Everybody has music. Like you. Has music. Like you. OK, right. Um, yeah. I would say I don't, really, speak after. I, don't, I don't really know, um, because I think that, that that question relates to people differently. Everybody has a different perspective on it. The only thing that I can say is that music has been so powerful in my life that has got me to where I am today. Um, it's a beautiful thing because music, it doesn't matter necessarily what it is, the rhythm, the sound is universal. Mm. I feel like food, love, and music is the one thing that connects us all. Um, and personally, there's just something that happens, and I'm only talking about my own personal experience. There is something that happens within my spirit, my aura, my energy, my demeanor, when I get up on, on a stage and I grab a mic and I perform, that I've always said that there has to be a greater being. There has to be, whether it is my ancestors, my own spirit, I don't know what it is, that I completely transform when I'm on stage and when I'm out of stage. I am somewhat timid and a little shy, and I don't, and I'm very to my corner and to myself, but when, when there is this presence of sound, of music, of rhythm, that just, I don't know, it's something that runs through my veins, my heart, my heartbeat. I think music is so powerful, it's been so powerful in my life that I've been in the deepest, you know, moments in my life. I, I've been homeless, I've been all types of things, and music has been the only thing, personally, that has been able to get me out of whatever state I've been in. I think, to your, to your point, that commercialism has torn our relationship to all of these things that have a very deeply spiritual root. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to ask the audience too, how many of you sing to yourself? Sing. <laughs> to you, or to your community, but sing. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying it as a, okay. as a gesture of, yeah. how many of you feel comfortable singing? Right? Even if you're off key, it doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> I did a ceremony, a, cer a plant medicine ceremony in Africa, and when we talked about it, everything was in community. Mm. So in order to, before you even started doing the ritual, everyone had to get up and sing. and sing to each other. And I think because of the commercialism, we put one person on a stage and a mic and everybody glitz and glamour and everybody thinks, oh, that's the person we're supposed to, but we forgot to, that we're supposed to be singing too. Yeah. Every day we're supposed to sing. Yeah. Well, Garvey, you had, you had something you want to say. Well, I think before there was sound, there's silence. And, and I think that's the essence of life. Mm. Life really is, is silent. And to understand yourself, mm. I, I think you have to follow that aspect of life that's with you all the time. And that's your breath. Because if you stop breathing, then, then you die. Breath is a constant reminder of your connection to life. Mm. And I think what Janine, Janine was, was trying to say, or saying actually, and I think she did it very, very well, is that you can use your breath to get to a deeper space. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> sound just sound. interrupted your, your silence. <laughs> sound can be interrupting, definitely, of silence. Um, yes, um, it, it's important for all of us to, to, to get to know ourselves. Because unless we know ourselves and we can transform ourselves, then what we're talking about will never happen. Because uh, there will be no change unless you are the change. And the only way to change yourself is, first of all, to know yourself. And the way to know yourself is to look into yourself. And you can only look into yourself in that silent moment. So silence is of extreme importance. And, and silence comes uh, before sound. And as a creative person, you know that you go into your silent space to get that creative message. I think you mentioned it before, that when you start to write, there are a thousand entities there with you. That's right. coming out of the silence of your, your mind and your space. Right. And, uh, you know, this is where I think you, you, you get to the necessity of, of love, because it's a feeling. Yeah. It's not a word. And it's not just the English language. It's, it's all words. All words are just descriptions. And that's why the, the Egyptians, they had a different sacred language, which was the hieroglyphic, mm -hmm. which was a symbol. If, if, if you saw a, um, a, a symbol of a cow, you knew exactly what it meant. But if you saw C-O-W, C-O-W doesn't mean anything. Mm. You know? But if you draw a cow, you know what that means. So, so language takes us out of ourselves. And it's important for us not to get caught up in language. We live in a culture. That's very, very linguistic. I mean, there are thousands of books out there about um, getting to know yourself or finding peace and tranquility and all of this kind of stuff. And I guarantee you, 99% of them have never been in that space that they're describing. Maybe they're just talking about it because somebody else may have been in it and they write about it over and over and over again. And it's the same thing with college and then education. You learn things that, that somebody else describes. Exactly. And then the textbook changed every five years. Yes. And that passes for knowledge, and, and, but it's really information. So for true knowledge, you need to go into yourself. And uh, what I'm advocating here, what I'm advocating here, again, is just what Janine said in terms of, uh, uh, which is meditation, to get into yourself. Because the problem with us as an African people, we have been disconnected from ourselves. Yeah. We are a spiritual people. If you look at it, everywhere there are black people. I think in Jamaica, there are more churches than bars and probably more churches per square mile than anywhere else in the world. I think it's the same thing in the southern United States and so on and so forth. So in the diaspora, in, in Africa, we are a spiritual people. But we have been disconnected from our spiritual source. And we have been given, somebody mentioned uh, religion, we have been given a religion that denies our connection even to the religion and to God and to Christ. Yeah. And, and this is where we're in a quandary of who we are. And we have to answer that question, who am I? Because that's the most fundamental question for all humanity. If you don't answer that question before you die, then you're going to have to come around again another time to get the answer. Far more. But you must answer the question, who am I? And you can only do it in that silent space. When you find out, and when you get that connection, just as Janine said, you, you will find out that the I is not just I. It's not an ego, but the I is I and I. It's, it's the little I with the big I, like the drop of water to the ocean. It's the, the, it's the unity with God. It's a non-dual reality that is our source. And this is the job that we have to do to reconnect with our roots, our true spiritual roots. And that's the only way we can... Um, how should I say, transform the materialistic power that is out there. Because let's face it, we're not going to have, you know, bigger bombs. We're not going to have more atomic bombs. We're not going to have more hydrogen bombs. But if we access our spiritual power, and in that way, uniting, that's the only way we can unite. Because when you're talking about what you talked about, community, and, and people singing to each other, that was the interconnection at the spiritual level. It wasn't just a physical thing, it wasn't just a voice. It was my presence relating to your presence. And, mm -hmm. and this is where we have to be because Organic. we have been taught to hate ourselves. And this is what manifests in so much of what we do. 
whether it's abuse at, at home or not wanting to organize with somebody else and being egotistical and not yes, sharing yes, information yes. and so on and so forth. These are all indices of self-hate and not knowing who we are. Mm. So we need to get back to our spiritual core. But we need to understand that the spiritual core is not necessarily in terms of the religions that we are inheriting, shall we say, from the Western world and elsewhere. The they are the true spirituality of our ancestors who understood it. And if you go back to Kemet and you know all about Ausar, Oset, and Heru, etc., etc., and, and Ra, Ebga, and Petah, and Amun, this is where we came from, and this is the reality, the absolute reality of the universe, which our ancestors understood 10,000 years before the Western world understood it. So that's the kind of job that we have to do in terms of, Marcus Garvey said, you know, liberate your mind from mental slavery. Marcus Garvey said that, you know, a, a people without knowledge of, of, of their origins, uh, history and culture is like a tree without roots. We need to know our history. We need to know the, 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 the wisdom and the wisdom literature that we had for thousands and thousands of years that has been distorted and destroyed and so on. We have work to do, yeah. but we can do it and we need to transform ourselves. Urgent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have, um, we don't have much, much more time, I think, but I want, until somebody comes out here and grabs me. I wanted to ask, um, we, I could not have this conversation without thinking about the context of what's going on outside our backyard. You know, Miami is a place, we were talking about Florida earlier and the, the spiritual re relevance of Florida and the Maroons and the community that was here. And we're, we're experiencing also Art Week. So y'all had to deal with the traffic getting here in Art Week. And I think it would, it would be, um, it's important since we're here having this conversation in, and talking about African, our relationship to the, the actually disrupting the idea of art. That art is, um, has been by the Western world taking things that actually had real function like our masks, which were part of rituals and spiritual reality, and putting them on a wall and saying, this is art. That often our art has been disconnected from the real source of what it's supposed to do, and the exploitation and the industry of art has made it so that we don't even realize that creating art is about communicating, about getting together. And I wanted to ask, what, is your, what, is, what are artists or who are artists that inspire you, that do the work that you believe needs to be done? And what is your practice and your relationship to art? Because art can be the way you cook, the way you fold your clothes, the way you clean your house, the way you love your wife, the way you, um, you know, take care of your children. Those are all forms of practicing our highest selves. So what is your relationship to that? You know, for me, uh, a, a form of art is really the sense of uh, not activism, but it's a sense to bring unity to communities that I live in. So I live in Boca, and I'm part of uh, the Baha'i faith, and part of the Sufi, uh, you know, which is kind of the, the, the ground uh, work for, for Baha'i faith. And, you know, there is the, this idea of progression of revelation. There is that, you know, we go back to the essence message, which is, you know, from Ethiopia, you know, the, that we are a spiritual being and, and that we are here like uh, stars, not a fallen stars, and that the whole universe is within us. And, and we have everything we, we want. It's right there for us. And that there is no sense for us to compete or to fight or, or to, you know, to let somebody actually oppress us because that is the worst thing is the oppression when we talk about the tyranny of... Uh, of ideologies or, or of colonization that's happened, you know, in, in the Western world, is to go back, you know, to, to, to ourselves, to being like, okay, I'm a human being. Yes, although I, I might, the world might see me small, but actually I matter. Because every time I raise my vibration, every time I'm a better person, every time I feel like the, my power, then I could make a difference. And the difference is like, you know, with, now, like in, Ch I'm in Chelsea, I used to do humanist work in Chelsea, New York, I'm sorry. But now I'm, I'm in Boca, sorry. So in, in Boca, so what we're doing is like bringing the different people together. So we have like a Pearl City, which is historically a, a slave uh, uh, city, and right in Boca. 
And you know, and it's completely ignored behind, uh, in, it kind of ignored behind the, the tracks. So what we've been doing, we've been going down there talking to the pastors and talking to community leaders and we're trying to bring, we started, we are bringing the community together to really bring justice back, you know, to recognize the people that were in that community and bring people into faith, you know, that everybody has their uh, a culture, you know, background, the religious background, but as long as we agree that we are spiritual being and that the essence is that I look at you as uh, another beautiful being and I admire what you have and I appreciate your, your strength, then we can work together. And everybody has, like you said, we are all have something unique about us. Like you're a beautiful artist that can sing on stage. I'm a beautiful person that can inspire people on an individual level and, and really help them heal or whatever it is, you know, poet and doctor and uh, amazing herbalist doctor or everybody has a talent. We can bring that talent to the community and, and we are in that process of bringing everybody together and it's been really... Uh, Great, you know, without politics. Mm. Politics out, and if people are fanatic religion, they, that's out too. But really, we're looking like, wait, wait, we don't have to, my religion is the true religion, or my color is the best color. No, but we could actually have, you know, a ground, uh, you know, place that we all work together and, and make, you know, this place a beautiful place, mm. you know? Thank so you. I invite you guys to that. <laughs> I would like to share with the audience on the first uh, question before I get to the art question on the subject of song and vibrations. And uh, this is something very important that we all should know that we all are vibrating at different hertz and different cycles on a daily and moment by moment basis, the earth also. And there's a movement of foot now where people are calling things like uh, taking off your shoes and walking on the earth grounding, Earthly. right, and earthing, yeah. and there's lots of information with that on, the, uh, on, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But what's very important that we should post to understand about ourselves is that these different chakras that we have in our systems, yes. they're all are vibrating, and when, when they all are working, all seven of them are working in, in unity, in unison with each other, they're all vibrating at one specific hertz. And it's like you're driving a car, you start from a first gear, you go all the way up to sixth gear or seventh gear, how many gears in the car, and then yeah, you find yourself smooth going like 70, 80 down the highway and then the cops stop you. So you got to sometimes know when to slow down, your hurts. So you can't go too fast and you can't go too slow. You got to have balance. Right. And so when you go home tonight, you can put on YouTube and you can deal with the hurts that deal with your heart chakra. Right? And that can really do wonders for you. So songs and vibration <coughs> is going on all around us all the time. And, and it's most amazing that how this conversation is moving from one aspect to the next, so we deal with the song, then we deal with the art. And so Mother Nature is our first artist. Hmm. She gave us everything. You, you go outside, you see the clouds, you see the trees, I know. you see the birds, you see the animals. And they're all creating art all the time. <laughs> ain't nobody Best buying. Art. <laughs> they're destroying. <laughs> so so what's happening now, art basically is that everybody's buying. Yep. So people are putting on value on certain things. And everybody's things. selling. Yeah, right. A lot of right. people selling yeah, right. themselves, they, too. Yeah, you, yeah. you got to have a buy to have a sell, right? Mm. So family, what I'll suggest you do, see that I'm the most famous artist when it comes to preparing drinks and food and tonics and herbs to make you feel good about yourself. <laughs> you, even though you might not know that, I do make you feel good about yourself. Right. You just got to come and try it. I give you a sample. <laughs> right? And that's my art right there. Yeah. And your covers. My art, yes. Just My give art. Us cards. Yeah. Um, so I want to thank our panelists for speaking with us today. Please give it up for our panelists. Yes, before we close out, I'll let everybody share something. I just want to say to everyone, thank you so much for listening. And also, you guys gave us some really good words to take home. If there's something you heard that resonated with you, please make sure that you carry it with you, you pray on it, you, you share it with someone else outside of here so that this vibration can leave and, and start to actually make a difference in the communities that we all are a part of. So I'm going to let people close out, and then we'll get ready to let the other uh, folks come up after. Okay. Brothers and sisters, 
there is a community and then there is the community of yourself mm. there are your organs your chakras there is the water balance there is the balance of all of the other elements in your body there is so much there is the universe within you there's lots going on outside and it's easy to get distracted by that but if we really want to do this transformational work it is not hard it just requires consistency because you do so many profound things in your life out there every day mm. incredible feats why not take some time to sit in silence and get to know yourself this is the call to action now there is so much I could say, but I just want to leave with you. If you can take a few moments of your day and sit in silence, breathing deeply through your nose, filling your belly from your diaphragm, just breathing, just give it a chance. I put to you that you have all the solutions to your problems already sitting there waiting to be unlocked. So please. And let us redefine the self. Let us as African people redefine the idea of self so that self includes all of us. That way we can be selfish, truly, and it means a good thing. Yeah? Thank you. Any followers? Um, I can just echo what John <laughs> I said. I think we all have to be the change that we want to see. Right. It won't yes, happen sir. without us changing. So that's our job. Yes, sir. Yeah, what I would like to leave you with is um, we have one heart. It doesn't matter what color, what race, what culture, you know, the whole universe. We are on a planet and we are all part of this planet. And when I look at a, a person, you know, I see myself. So my advice or my invitation to you guys is what? Pick two kind of people, one that you like most and one you hate most. That really triggers you. You see this person, maybe your boss, maybe your wife, your husband, your son, your daughter, somebody, you know, somebody, a neighbor. Okay, I moved too much. <laughs> you know, your neighbor, you know, maybe uh, whatever. It's some, somebody that you, um, it really triggers your whatever. So you look at that and see what aspect of your heart that needs to be purified. The person that you hate the most, yet a part of it is within us. And we need to clean that part to purify it, to beautify it, and we'll live a really great life. Mm. And the ones you love, that's you. So if I admire this model, that means I have that beauty too. So whatever you see, it's like you are the beholder of that beauty. Mm. So also see that. You're beautiful. <laughs> On my behalf, um, after all these, after all these amazing speeches, right, what do you say afterwards, but um, I can only speak from my truth. I would say that uh, to close out tonight, I would like to say most definitely self-love, self-acceptance is so important to me mm -hmm. because I've suffered it, I've lived it, I've, I've surpassed it most definitely, mm -hmm. but self-love is so important, self-acceptance, accepting who you are, the way that you are, with all your imperfections or whatever, however it is you may perceive it. Mm -hmm. I think that it's so important to look at yourself in the mirror and love who you are and love what you're doing and staying true to yourself. If your gut or if your intuition tells you not to do something, mm -hmm. follow it. It's there for a reason. You know, mm -hmm. I think that that is so important. Sometimes we can get lost with society and everything that's happening in our surroundings. So Thank just learn you. to accept who you are, love it, and keep moving Beautiful. forward. Thank you. Close us out, brother. I love you all. Yeah. <laughs> but I love you. What I would like to say <laughs> is that you're truly awesome. You're really beautiful people. And you have a very special thing to do. And you all know what you have to do. You're born the gift and the talent. And there's no forces stopping you from accomplishing what you will. Mm -hmm. Where are you Thank living you. right here, right now? This is your temple. Yes. And your thoughts is constantly reproducing everything that's going on inside here. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that this message that I share with you is that when you move from place to place, you're living in different zones. Right now we're in a, a northern hemisphere zone. Florida is not as northern as some other parts of the America, like New York and Virginia. But the fact remains that the energy is changing. And you're biologically connected to the energies. Your organs and glandular systems are connected to the energies. So right now, your kidneys 
Your kidneys and your small intestines are connected to this period that is coming up right now. They call it the winter, the winter solstice. So it's very important that you understand the process. So what's going to be happening now, if you hold on to energies that is the negative energies, anger, frustration, jealousy, those things will affect your kidneys. And this part of the world, they call it SAD, Seasonal Affected Disorder. And then another aspect of that is the South American diet. So whatever you're thinking is what you're going to be eating. Mm. So please take care of your kidneys this period for the next three months. And please take care of your intestines for the next three months. Thank Give you. We are a beautiful oh, people, doctor. and when we love ourselves, we will astonish the world. So we give it up for yourselves, and we're going to move on to the next honey. segment of the night. Give it up. Give it up for this beautiful panel, y'all. Give it up. Miss Aja Monet, Sister Janine, Dr. Marcus Garvey, Dr. Rashida Faid, beautiful Amara La Negra, and Brother Baba Pearson.